So good evening and a warm welcome to everyone who's come out tonight. Thank you. It's lovely to see such a large crowd. And, uh, and there are also people joining us online. So welcome to you as well. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping uh, for the people online. Please, can you remain muted and keep your video switched off during the talk? You're very welcome to uh, switch them both on at the end of the talk and ask questions. During the talk, you can also um, ask questions in the chat. And uh, we'll get to them at the end when the uh, questions in the room are also asked. So, again, thank you for coming. My name is Joe Houlihan. I organise the Military History Group here at the BRLSI. We started this year, um, and among the topics we've covered so far are uh, the Normans, Roman history. Um, we had a war artist who was uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and tonight, I'm really pleased to introduce a fascinating story about a fascinating individual, um, Frank Brock, uh, whose story is like something from a boy's own story, really. Um, this talk was organized by Harry Smee, who is grandson of Frank Brock. But uh, Harry's not here tonight, but his brother Mark is here, so he's also the grandson of Frank. And uh, Mark, you, some of you may know Mark as the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner for Avon and Somerset. He's also uh, perfectly suited to deliver a talk about Frank being his, a, his grandson and also coming from a military background himself, having been a cavalry officer driving tanks. Um, so I'll hand over to Mark Shelford now to tell us the extraordinary story of Frank Brock. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for coming uh, tonight on this miserable uh, night outside, but we'll warm the cockles of your heart tonight by this incredible story of daring do. And if they made the story up, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, it is just quite uh, uh, amazing. Um, some of you have already um, had a drink, which is fantastic, uh, and donations for drink to Safa. What better... Uh, service charity than SAFA for tonight because my grandfather held the commission in all three services during the First World War concurrently. Apart from royalty, there's only one other man I know of who did that in the Second World War. Quite, uh, quite an extraordinary feat. So SAFA, which is uh, representing soldiers, sailors and airmen families, um, is here tonight. Many of the organisers from the South West are here tonight. So thank you very much uh, for those donations. If you want to buy the book, um, a signed first edition is at the back, uh, 20, 20 quid to you, um, and, um, and I take cash. Um, so let's crack on. Um, the 24th of October is an auspicious day, A, because it's my mother's birthday, but also because it was the day when uh, Frank Brock and his uh, fiance got married. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because, of course, inevitably in his life, it was never simple. So who is Frank Brock? This fella, this very handsome fella on board HMS Vindictive on the way to Zeebrugge. Now, when he actually went on to the moan at Zeebrugge, which we'll hear about later, uh, he was wearing a uh, khaki uh, army uniform, but um, naval rank, although he was a wing commander and known as a wing commander uh, when he died. How many of you tonight are part of Bath or any Rotary Club? One, brilliant. Okay. Um, the reason I ask that, because there's quite a bit, Harry wrote this uh, presentation, there's quite a bit about fireworks in it, and I might just shorten that a bit uh, if there isn't that particular interest uh, from the Rotary Club um, for the fireworks. But um, let's quickly go into the main body of the story. Little known now, you will you will learn this evening of the reason why Frank Brock is one of the most effective and important British officers of the Great War. 
Even then, his inventions had to be kept fairly secret. And after his death, the extent of his contribution to our victory was not widely known. My brother worked uh, in the family business, Brock Starbucks, in the 80s, and had formed the impression that the stories of the century-old enterprise and Frank's life were remarkable. Um, it was a hidden history, and they deserve to be told. In the First World War, it seems that Frank was contemporarily commissioning to military services, as I've said, and as well as being the eighth generational pyrotechnic. He was a spy. He was an intelligence officer. He was a brilliant inventor. And he was also a courageous combatant. A combination of James Bond and Q, he changed weather twice in our favour, giving the British and their allies two of the best feel-good moments of this terrible conflict. Frank's contribution to the British war effort was so impressive that we felt it had to be given an explanation. And this is what is in the book at the back. And tonight, um, I will only touch on a few things that's in here. Um, it's a rocketing read from start to finish. Tonight's talk is basically in three sections. The first uh, is a background to the life to which Frank was born into. And we'll whiz through that. Some of Frank's life uh, up uh, to his last 24 hours, and then the battle that he planned and in which, sadly, he disappeared. So first, some of the background. In, 2000, in, in 1905, uh, in a newspaper interview, my great great grandfather, Arthur Brock, suggested that the family firework enterprise uh, may have been fizzing from the early 1640s. But the first definitive evidence was uh, on the 5th of November, 1720, when John Brock, um, the artist in fireworks, blew himself up um, in London and was buried at St. James's uh, Church, uh, Clerkenwell. Here is a picture of John as he was imagined by a painter and a close friend of Frank's younger brother, the historian and novelist, uh, Alan Brock. For our purposes, um, we mark this as John as the first pyrotechnic. Um, and then we go on. Uh, he was involved uh, in the French King's uh, contract for fireworks at the Palace of Versailles to celebrate the marriage of his son, the Dauphin of France, to the Emperor's uh, enduring the famous youngest daughter, the 14-year-old Marianne Antoinette. Uh, later in the 18th century, the business had moved out to East London, uh, and by early 19th century, the firm was run by William Brock, uh, the fifth generation uh, firework maker. Now, uh, William went out for breakfast one day. He liked a boy's fat boy's breakfast. Uh, he went out with his leading hands, and as he was tucking into his bacon and eggs, there was the most almighty noise uh, that announced the end of the world. And his firework uh, factory had ignited, um, he's blown up his house, his businesses, all his neighbours' houses. Uh, indeed, the entire street was blown cinema rooms. Um, but saved by the love of good breakfast, uh, which I love on a Saturday, uh, William uh, survived and he managed to rebuild uh, the firm, the factory, the street that he'd blown up, um, and his young grandson, Charles Brock, took over. Um, Charles uh, only lived into his late uh, 30s, dying natural courses, but he revolutionised the way that fireworks uh, were made transported, displayed around the world. And I remember as a young boy going up to the factory, which had then, when I was young, moved up to Sanka. And it was split in, it looked like a prison camp because there were tiny little huts, each separated out. And then there was a big dividing uh, wall and barbed wire between the two sections where phosphorus and gum patterns never mix. Um, and there was changing rooms and shower rooms and everything. So the people could never mix. Uh, and there were separate canteens and things uh, in there. And so at the end of the shift, 
they all showered and then were able to go home and then they could mix but at work they could never mix in order to prevent explosion and for those you many members in the audience i know who are ex-military you will know what munition bunkers look like now how they're separated out uh, covered over and it was rather like that anyway uh, it was Charles who invented this, and he also invented a number of uh, different ways of entertaining using fireworks, including producing portraits for the first time in fireworks. So tying lots of little uh, fireworks that were linked together in a portrait uh, and then had an instantaneous fuse that would light them all at the same time. Um, as part of this, uh, the... British government used rocks as soft power to go around the empire and influence. And particularly known uh, as the Great Game, worried that the Russians would attempt an invasion of uh, British industry by way of the Caspian Sea and Persia. London made sure that the Shahs of Persia were enthusiastic and not infrequent visitors to London. And that's a sort of design of the, uh, of the fireworks as you see is a portrait of individual spots. Um, uh, and this uh, happened over a series of decades at Crystal Palace. In addition to the Shahs, Prince of Wales, basically King Edward VII, and other members of the royal family would accompany the royals, the Russian Tsar, the Sultan of Turkey, the Khedive of Egypt, the Russian Grand Duke, and the German Kaiser. Um, uh, the kings of Spain, Portugal, Greece, and other visiting European royalties, including the viceroy of the Chinese emperor. Uh, there was also the emperor of Brazil, the sultan of Zanzibar, the king of the Zulus, the king of the Maoris, the king of something I can't pronounce, uh, Indian princesses, Maharaja, and other rulers who all came to Crystal Palace. Uh, a long piece in the spectator from July 1873. By the way, I occasionally read the Spectator. It clearly is a very good one if it's lasted that long. Uh, British and June, one of the Shah state visits, acknowledged that this British technique with fireworks was particularly effective and impressive for our Asiatic kings when combined with showing off our capital city, London. In 1875, uh, just 18 years after the Indian Mutiny, the Prince of Wales set off for a long tour of India, and to accompany him, Brock sent out uh, two teams of men, and in those days, millions of pounds worth of fireworks. Um, and there was an enormous tour uh, around India. And this is important because um, the then uh, Frank Brock, uh, join on one of these tours. Representing uh, many displays uh, around um, when Victoria was proclaimed Empress. And here is a, a picture, the sort of portraits that were um, produced. And it was into this glittering pedigree of black powder that the eighth generational pyrotechnics, Arthur's elder son, Frank Brock, was born in 1884. But before we explore Frank's life, I wanted to touch on the intersection between fireworks and military pyrotechnics. Brock's price list from the mid-1860s offered ammunition, and in the late 1860s, some well-dressed gentlemen arrived at Charles's factory. They represented the government of the French Emperor, Emperor Napoleon III. They wanted Charles to make a large quantity of military pyrotechnics for their impending war against Prussia. He was delighted to accept. Profits from the substantial value of the contract allowed him to build a large new factory, unlike anything else built before in the world. And it was from here in South Norwood that Brock sent thousands of tons of fireworks out to the furthest reaches of the British Empire, including the USA uh, and parts of Europe. 
Frank attended Dulwich College uh, and in what uh, and what is now South East London. And um, famously, uh, in an experiment that might have been improved, he blew up a form room stove. Now, probably relieved uh, his pupils had survived unscathed, uh, the headmaster, who was one of Frank's admirers, uh, led him off with a caning, and Fireworks Brock had a reputation at school uh, for ever and a day. He was a disgustingly healthy some athlete, a champion boxer, a fantastic shot uh, with a pistol. Um, and he had a great brain. And when I've asked my brother and a number of members of the family, but was somebody so accomplished a nice person to be around? They said he was, and he didn't really have an ego, which is extraordinary uh, when you think of all the things uh, that he was good at. But 18, he took a decision not to go to university. And he left school in 1902 and accompanied his father, uh, Arthur, out to India, where they and Brock's team put on a significant contribution to displays, including the Delhi uh, Durbar. Now, uh, Frank is the one uh, in the middle, um, what looks like wearing a dress, but apparently boys in those days um, did. Um, actually, I'll give myself a hot water, I'm going to move on. Um, uh, this is um, Frank and Brock's men in front of the Juma Majest in uh, January 2003. And these are other displays uh, from Delhi. And then he did the most amazing uh, display at Spithead, uh, a colossal show he staged at age 21 in, 2000, uh, in 1905 with 58 warships, 6,000 men for the Entente Cordiale with France, it marked him out in military circles as a genius. And as a sideline, importantly, he began to secret develop, secretly to develop improved smoke screens for the Navy. In 1903, the first man-made powered flight took place uh, with the Wright brothers. And um, Sally and I, when we were in America, we actually went to the field. It's tiny. <laughs> you can't imagine anybody taking off, flying and landing in it. And I think it's in um, on the border between North and South Carolina, Carolina is the two moment. Okay, well done. I knew my wife from there. Um, uh, importantly, though, in, in 2008, H.G. Wells published uh, War in the Air about a fleet of German airships uh, flying across the Atlantic and destroying the USA. This also coincided uh, with several belligerent remarks made in Berlin of how the new Zeppelin airships would kill everybody uh, with whom. The Germans disagreed. German Zeppelins, uh, its growing militarism, and <clears throat> fears these had in, would endanger the public, explains why Arthur Brock decided to make a Zeppelin attack a centerpiece of his firework display at Crystal Palace um, in the season of uh, 1909. And that's the cover for the book. This is a pivotal moment in our story uh, for this time now. Frank would ponder on how best to counter these massive, terrifying airships. If you think about it, those early aeroplanes weren't able to easily reach the altitude of the Zeppelins. And if they just fired a bullet at a Zeppelin, it would go through the hole and out the other side. Uh, tracers in those days, which had phosphorus in the tail, would only um, have a range of uh, 1,100 meters, which is in fact still today, the range that those have. So it's actually really difficult to get close enough. And the Zeppelins were armed with, with significant machine guns that could hold their own uh, against those early airplanes. So it actually pondered a real problem. A, to get the aircraft up there, then to have the time up there to fly, to engage the Zeppelin and then to get down again. So think of that, 
was going through his mind when he was sent out once more to India to put on a coronation display before the newly crowned emperor, uh, King George V. While in Delhi, terrorists um, attempt to assassinate Lord uh, Harding, the Viceroy. The attempts failed, although uh, the bomb thrown at the Viceroy's Howder killed his servant and embedded shrapnel in Harding's back. Frank was called in to analyze the chemicals left on the silver of the Howder. And he was able to identify the explosive uh, used and gave the police valuable evidence. And the assassins were eventually identified and caught. Why I raise that, because being the police and crime commissioner, it's one of the first um, evidence of forensic science being used in a case uh, in order to prosecute uh, people, perpetrators. And I think that's fascinating, especially that as I'm now going through the process of, of re-engaging a forensic contract within the Southwest. Uh, I wish I had Frank's knowledge of chemistry. Um, Frank returned home and traveled extensively in Europe for 18 months. Uh, in 1914, he was negotiating right up to the beginning of July, less than a month before the war broke out. He picked up a valuable series of displays at the massive Dusseldorf Exhibition Center. Those of you who know where Dusseldorf is, it's sort of in the middle of Germany, middle of West Germany. Um, and with an opportunity there, being in Germany, he, he went on his first spy mission, mission, dressed as an American with an appropriate accent, apparently. Uh, um, no one thought America would enter a possible future European war. He managed to enter on an open day when the Zeppelins were on display, uh, and based on what he saw, he began to construct ideas of how to defeat the Zeppelins. When war broke out, he joined the army, the Royal Horse Artillery, and made his interest in Zeppelins known to Murray Sorter, who ran the Royal Naval Air Service, the RNAS. That was uh, what happened before the Fleet Air Arm and before the formation of the Royal Air Force that came from uh, effectively the Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service. And this was directly beneath Winston Churchill, who was then the first Lord of the Admiralty. Um, Frank, uh, so Frank Brock is standing on the left of the picture in military uniform, uh, looks like a lieutenant there from what I can see. Um, and standing above his fiance, uh, G. And this was the family in the autumn of 1914 uh, preparing uh, for war. On the 24th of October 1914, 108 years ago today, Harry and my grandparents, Frank and G, were married in London. After the ceremony, a glass of champagne was drunk, but Frank's boss, Sosa, the head of the Royal Naval Air Service, intervened to delay the honeymoon. Churchill had given him permission to attack the Zeppelin bases, the first strategic bombing raid in history, and he borrowed Frank uh, from the army, and on that afternoon of his wedding day, he was sent to Paris, where he was given false papers from our embassy. Now, this book... Uh, this book tells the story, but also this book, um, Flat Pack Bombers by Ian Gardner, tells the story in a hell of a lot more depth, and I recommend it to you if you're interested in it, of how they uh, bought uh, Avros um, from Shorts in Belfast, put them into boxes, tea boxes, and then shipped them to France, and then put them on to trains and took them down to the south. Uh, to a uh, base. And the book tells the story how Frank and another officer, the extraordinary eccentric Noel Pennington Billings, who then founded uh, a firm called Supermarine um, that would go on to build Spitfire, 
um, tricked their way into Switzerland and from there into Germany to Friedrichshagen, um, where the then uh, Zeppelin base was. And they basically watched as the bombing raid came in um, uh, onto Friedrichshagen. And um, I just pause for a second there. Look at how young his face looks. Uh, when he was aged 29, and then a few years later, this is G, his uh, fiance, and then wife, my grandmother. And um, this is the attack uh, by the Navy uh, onto Friedrichshagen. Now, this, this was an amazing feat of airmen, and I know we've got a, a, a fighter pilot in our midst. Um, it's, they were sent from Belfort in uh, a French airfield without maps, because the French were terrified that if an airplane was downed, they could work back on the map to where it had come from, and the, and the Germans would then bomb the base. So they had to go only on compasses. Remember, they're flying over part of the Alps at the same time. Now, I found it bloody hard to navigate on a compass across Salisbury Plain when I was a soldier, only without a map. God knows how they managed to do it in an airplane. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Remember, without maps or radios, um, in an open cockpit, uh, with at least one of the pilots having never flown that make of aeroplane before. I mean, you wouldn't have gone in an aeroplane you'd never flown before, certainly not on, a, on an operational mission. Um, uh, Pembington, Billy, I guess, so it's an eccentric uh, British officer. Which one of, of these is Pembington Billings? Guess, anybody? Uh, one, two, three. No. It's that one. Yeah. with the monocle dress as a French officer. I mean, he was just the most extraordinary place. And he drove Frank uh, from uh, Calais, once they packed the ship to go south, uh, packed the train to go south, he drove him in his white Rolls Royce. Well, of course, if you're going to be a spy and go on a spy mission, why aren't you in a white Rolls Royce? Everybody else does it. Um, so they... Uh, got in um, and uh, Frank and he went across uh, to Friedrichshagen to watch the bombing mission come in and do that assessment of how successful it was. Uh, and then they jumped back on the boat um, and paddled back to uh, Switzerland. Now, the raid did not deliver a great deal of material damage, but was a terrific propaganda success right around the world. And um, this is the medal ceremony uh, before the mission. Um, on his return, Frank was introduced to Churchill, who uh, made the decision to order Frank to design, construct, commission, and command a secret station in East London, close to today's, well, 2012 Olympic Stadium. And on the 1st of January, 1915, Frank was commissioned into the RNAS but retains his commission in the army. At this stage, because he was designing a bullet to bring down the Zeppelin, he decided it was a good idea to go and learn to fly. So he just potted off to the local airfield and said, any chance you could teach me how to fly? As he did. Um, so, uh, Early in uh, 1915, the Germans launched their first Zeppelin bombing raid over uh, the UK. And it was indeed terrifying, unlike anything else in the history of warfare. And we were, the, the, the British and everybody else were helpless because they were quite unable to touch them, as I explained earlier on. Um, at his home, uh, Frank and G were now proud parents of a little girl, my mother, and Rock. He was born exactly 107 years ago today. And 365 days after her parents were married um, on the day when he left for his first mission in France. And there is Frank with my mother. 
at work, Frank's new boss, uh, Murray Souter, uh, was notorious for saving the pennies, these bloody people. Um, at his own expense, therefore, Frank worked on um, explosive incendiary uh, bullets. And this was designed to work on the matchbox principle. So sensitive was it that as the bullet passed through the fabric uh, of the Zeppelin, it would explode, creating a hole big enough in the skin of the Zeppelin to mix hydrogen and air in sufficient quantities to make an explosion uh, happen. And um, this is the success. Um, in September uh, 1916, the first night of Frank, the first night of Frank bullets were used, the Zeppelin baby killers began to be ripped out of the sky and the Kaiser's dream of air superiority died. Meanwhile, the officer said to have had the second only in significance to Nelson in the Royal Navy's history, uh, Admiral Jackie Fisher, was keeping a close eye on Frank. Frank flipped, um, split his time between the secret search uh, station at Stanford and Fisher's Board of Invention and Research, where the brightest scientists in Britain were uh, gathered and tasked at puzzling out answers to the most uh, pressing problems. Over these years, Frank invented and developed many items that Britain would use, including defences against poison gas, uh, many flares for ships, for aeroplanes, and for soldiers in the trenches. He invented smoke floats for merchant ships to hide them from submarines and coloured filters for binoculars, goggles, cameras, and uh, to counter difficult meteorological conditions. Uh, in order to make clear vision uh, possible. Now, those smoke floats were really interesting because I'll come back to it. In those days, if you produce lots of smoke, you had a big phosphorus flare, big white light. So if you wanted to have smoke at night, you didn't want to have the flare. And this was a problem that Frank was wrestling with uh, in order to be able to do it. Um, interestingly, to the, to the fighter pilots here, um. Um, he made the first British to air to air missile, uh, the Brock immediate rocket slung between the wings of a fighter biplane for use pri primarily against observation and barrage balloons. He also developed the idea of signaling the prisons and an early theory practiced on how to improve the accuracy of bomb aimed from airplanes because they were notoriously um, uh, um, it, it was very difficult to accurately bomb from above. Given the hundreds of missiles currently crossing the skies of the Ukraine, it's interesting to note that Frank was involved with the first guided air-to-air -air missile, invented and developed in the First World War by the prolific English inventor Archibald Lowe. And after the war, when Lowe applied for a patent, the application cited Frank as having developed the motor for the rocket. Following the indecisive naval battles of Jackland in 1916, the Germans, German admirals reported to the Kaiser that it would be impossible to beat the Royal Navy. Their only chance of victory, he thought, would be to reintroduce unrestricted submarine warfare, sinking every ship found near British waters and forcing the UK to the negotiating table. In February uh, 1917, this was unleashed, and quite soon an alarming ton tonnage of Allied shipping was being sunk. In the summer of 17, the Royal Cabinet asked the Chiefs of Staff campaigning plans for 1918, and the first senior of Admiral Jellicoe replied that unless they could find a way of stopping the Germans sinking our ships, there would be nobody fighting in 1918, we would have to negotiate a peace. Towards the end of 1917, the British government's war committee uh, minuted that there was nothing more important than closing down Zeebrugge on the Belgian coast as uh, the most immediate submarine port. Um, one of Frank's solutions was a flare three feet high with a diameter of eight inches that weighed 90 pounds. 
each one burned for seven and a half minutes uh, with the strength of a million candle power, brilliantly illuminating an area about three miles square and a technology that would later be used by the pathfinders in the Second World War. It was called the deck or the David Flair, and they were put across the channel. In those days, there was a anti-submarine net across the whole of the channel from, the, from England to France uh, with drifters and trawlers uh, that held it up. And these Dover flares were put on the back of all of those um, trawlers and drifters. And then um, when they needed to ignite it, if they could hear or see uh, the submarine, uh, they would just throw it into the water, it would automatically um, explode. And this is um, a, a shot of the light curtain. Um, uh, so th this is actually at Crystal Palace, but it shows the significance of the strength of the magnesium that was used uh, in those uh, flares. So what that meant for the, for the submarines, the U-boats, um, when they were caught on the surface in light, uh, they would try and hop over the net and dive deeply down to the bottom, but where we had laid uh, a minefield. And the first night that Frank's flares were used in December 1917, a U-boat UB-56 was destroyed this way. Uh, and later it was estimated that before the armistice on the 11th of uh, 1918, about a dozen more had followed it down to the seabed, caught by the light and the mines. Um, politically at that time, Jellicoe uh, was replaced as the first of the Sea Lord, and Roger K Keyes was um, took over as the commanding admiral of the Dover Patrol. Uh, within a day of arriving in Dover, he summoned Frank, um, uh, to set up a research establishment in Dover to support uh, the blockage of the port in Zeebrugge. Keyes would rely very heavily on Frank's assistance. In fact, the raid would be impossible without it. Frank moved a sizable contingent of his officers and men from the RAS Stratford secret research establishment down to Dover, where he set up a new factory. Keyes asked Frank to help with many innovations. Frank agreed, but on the one basis that he would be allowed to take part in the raid. He was sure that the Germans had a superior sound ranging artillery uh, rangefinder, um, and he was desperate to bring back one to make sure that the British, he could study it and produce the, a British equivalent. Keyes did not want to risk something in Frank's talents, but after a robust discussion, which apparently was extremely noisy by all the people who were bound with the other officers, he eventually consented. So here is uh, the moan at Zeebrugge. And actually, if you, if you go to Zeebrugge now, a lot of it is still there, although this part is actually built out. And the cunning plan was, uh, here was a railway bridge, and they would send a submarine packed with explosive into, the, into this bridge and blow it up, stop reinforcement of the mole. Um, they would bring the flotilla of uh, ships onto the mole. Um, Vindictive, which we'll come back to, was to be placed as a distraction on the mole. And then around the side would come uh, block ships, which were old cruisers filled with concrete, so they only just floated and packed with explosives. And ahead of them were a whole bunch of small motor torpedo boats creating artificial smoke. So that was the that was the cunning plan. And when they blew up the, the block ships in the canal entrance, uh, then uh, the motor, motor, motor torpedo boats would pick them up and then take them back to safety. So that, that was the, the, the plan. Frank's main task was to invent a new smoke screen, one that was impenetrably uh, to anybody looking at it, capable of hiding a fleet, and crucially, one that did not give away its position by flame at night. Something that up till then, the Royal Navy never had. And it was based on chlorosulfuric acid. As you all know, that's known as Saxon, um, and it's used by diabetes diabetics in place of sugar. 
Um, Frank developed this brilliant smoke screen and the Royal Navy was continued, continued to use this through the Second World War. Uh, there were insufficient supplies of this chemical in the UK and the government put out a public statement saying that there were health concerns for its use by diabetic, diabetic, diabetics uh, and that it needed to be looked into and for this reason access would be stopped until further notice. Meanwhile, all of the chemical was diverted uh, to Frank um, where he was testing that at one of the bases. This is actually Wormwood Scrubs uh, where he's experimenting and you can see um, the enormous effect that it was having. So um, Frank was a tactician as well as an inventor and he also suggested a previously untied, untried way of developing the smoke. He proposed that uh, coastal motorboats should go in close to the mole, to, to, the mole uh, to within a few yards if possible and lay smoke screens at full speed and then dash to and fro across the front of the line of approach. It was tested clearly here uh, and it was found to work well and was adopted. But consequently, the British task force, for the raid of Zeebrugge, would consist of 78 craft and be led uh, by the old cruiser HMS Vindictive, on which Frank would sail. Now, this is Vindictive, uh, and you will see the uh, scaling ladders for the Marines and Green Jackets that would go aboard and try and get onto the mole. And the reason was that there was a very, very high wall on that mole. And if you, if you go there today and you get onto the mole and walk around, you'll see how high the wall is. And they had to get over the top of it to mm -hmm. the sea. Um, the Vindictive was under command of Captain Alfred um, Carpenter, and it'd been equipped with a false top deck and 18 wooden ramps to get the landing parties on top of the 29 foot high seawall as quickly as possible. Prominent on the upper deck were two mattress uh, protected steel um, cages fore and aft, which were Frank's uh, men had installed two deadly frame furs. Um, all told, there were some 1,700 men, all volunteers, that were selected to take part in various uh, capacities. Of these, there were 600 Royal Marines, uh, and 200 naval blue jackets that would go ashore on the mole. The three obsolete cruisers uh, had been chosen to end their careers blocking the entrance of the canal. Uh, uh, and there was far more in the story that I can possibly tell you now. But the actual raid um, took about an hour, almost exactly an hour. And here is a snippet from Captain Carpenter's post-war recollections that gives you a picture of Frank's singular ability in order to help plan the raid. And remember, he worked very closely with him down in Dover. It would be difficult for anyone to speak too highly of when Commander Frank Bott, an inventive genius uh, than whom the country had no better. His smoke screens was a wonderful achievement, but his inventive mind was not satisfied. To him, we owed the special flares intended turning darkness into light. A mm -hmm. special boy was wanted, one that would automatically provide its own light on being thrown into the water. Brock made so little of the problem that he produced such a boy, designed, constructed, it, ready for use in less than 24 hours. Special signal lights were required. Brock produced them. Flame projectors, far exceeding anything uh, hitherto known, were mooted. Brock produced them also. No matter what the requirement, Brock was undefeated. Finally, on the 22nd of April, all was ready and the task force set out. And here is the vindictive uh, setting out. You can see those gantries on the side, those ladders uh, for the Royal Marines to charge up. Thanks to his artificial fog, the Germans were taken by surprise, only seeing the British force in the last moment when the wind changed direction, but sadly it still gave them enough time to slaughter many of our men. One shell alone killed 30 on the Vindictive. Frank himself could have stayed on board in comparative safety when the raid took place, but that wasn't his style. Now here's an interesting uh, picture 
This is um, the vindictive after the raid. And you can see all the bullet holes and the shrapnel at the top. And it was thought that the Germans panicked when they saw this armada oh. arrive. Oh. No. Um, uh, they panicked when they saw this armada arrive uh, and they were just firing at the top rather than what they should have been doing, which is firing under the waterline to sink the ships. And so you can see they got absolutely smashed pieces. And this is one of the flamethrowers uh, on the front, and there's another one on the back. But both uh, of these, um, the mattresses that were supposed to be bullet protection uh, didn't cover the fuel pipes. So the fuel pipes were cut, so the flame projectors didn't work, which is one of the reasons why Frank then went uh, shore. Um, so he went to shore, um, and this is uh, uh, an image uh, painted afterwards uh, of what it, what it might have looked like. And, and when he went to shore, he had two pistols, um, a cutlass, several hand grenades, um, and he apparently leapt to shore with the Royal Marines uh, into a blaze of German bullets and shell. An unidentified member of a group uh, later told the Northern Daily Mail. We were one of the earliest crowds to go over and Commander Brock went ahead. It was a fearful job getting over the brow, but the commander dropped down onto the mole, um, a distance of at least 10 feet, and said, come on you boys, he shouted, and one by one we followed him. Frank sprinted towards the mole extension in the face of intense fire from one or more machine guns. After 40 yards, he stopped in a stairway at the bottom, which several Germans were sheltering. Able seaman, uh, able seaman Albert Mackenzie told his brother in a subsequent letter, there was a spiral staircase which led down uh, onto the mole, and Commander Brock fired his revolver down and dropped a Mills grenade. Uh, we ought to have seen those Germans nip out and try and get across to the destroyer that was on the other side of the mole. In fact, the party had arrived um, at a squat concrete looking outpost. Above it was some equipment that Franklin believed to be the rangefinder that they, he was looking for. He told, that he, he told the men that he intended to go inside to investigate and with a seaman lobbed a number of grenades into the building in case it contained any surprises. There are different accounts of what happened next. Some reports say that Frank produced spanners and wrenches from his pockets and entered the deserted observation post before climbing up to examine the range finder on the top. Numerous reliable accounts, uh, including uh, Key's official report to the Admiralty, indicated that he'd not spend long looking at the lookout, lookout post and was quickly on the move again with the intention of catching up with the others. According to air mechanic Entwistle, who had accompanied him off the ship, a machine gun opened up as Frank sprinted forward again. Entwistle recalled, I dropped down behind some gear just at the moment, it was very dark and very smoky, and I saw the commander Brock either fall forward or commence to run. I could not say which. When the firing had stopped, I crawled round to see where I'd last seen Commander Brock but there was no sign of him. As it turned out, Frank was not dead. After Entwistle lost sight of him, uh, he was seen charging towards the lighthouse extension on the end of the mole with cutlass in one hand and a pistol in the other. A sergeant of the uh, Royal Marine Light Infantry told the Coventry Evening Telegraph on his return to England. Brock rushed uh, amongst the gun crew, fighting with his naked fists and knocking over the enemy who tried to bar his path. Behind the brave officer came our men in increasing numbers. The Germans put on a hard fight, but they were driven back step by step. And all through one of the finest sights I've ever seen was Commander Brock letting Jerry have it with his fists. Every time he got his fists out, a, fist, a fritz went down, or at least um, went down. Sorry, fritz went home, or at least went down. Very soon they gave him a wide berth, contenting themselves to fire at him. And I can't say what happened to him, but he disappeared from sight soon after that. Now, a German Marine officer quoted a fortnight later in 
Thompson Weekly News told a similar tale of a British officer who seemed to be entirely devoid of fear. He did not seem to mind anything. He rushed straight at the first gun with his fists and struck out at the gunners, knocking him down uh, and putting the rest to flight. The men on the other gun positions tried their hardest to get into action before this attack reached them, but all to no purpose. The British officer and his men were on top of us and overpowered our gunners before they could do anything. I clearly saw that this was a daring officer who was our greatest danger, and I ordered my men to fire on him. It was true there was some danger of hitting my own men, but it was important to knock this British officer out. And if the end was achieved, I did not care about anything else. Even now, it's possible injured Frank evidently refused to call it a day. According to more than one report, Frank was on the point of planting demolition charges to blow up a moored motor torpedo boat, uh, V-69, uh, which he believed to be a threat to the indictive when the group was attacked by a German unit led by Uber Lieutenant uh, Adolf Rodewell. There followed a savage hand-to-hand -hand fight, and it is likely that one of the men in the deadly encounter was Herman Kuhn, a 20-year-old crewman from the torpedo boat S-53, in which uh, he had served during the Battle of Jutland as a very young sailor. And it was moored next to the V-69. Um, the Englishman he took on was almost certainly Frank, uh, and the German reports speak of Kuhn attacking the British officer armed with a revolver and a cutlass and slashing him across the neck with a cutlass. And the British officer thought desperately wounded, stabbed the German as he fell. A German gunnery officer who witnessed the fight, Richard Pollock, uh, gave a slightly different version of events. He said that the British officer, who was on the point of laying demolition charges, stabbed Kuhn first, and then um, as he stabbed, uh, he was stabbed in the neck by the German. And it's probably the last time a British officer fought and died in a sword fight. Both bodies were found a few feet apart, and though nothing can be stated for certain, all evidence suggests that British officer was Frank and that this was how he met his death. A local Flemish uh, military historian who I've met uh, became fascinated by the battle and spent years studying every movement and every square foot. Uh, when I mean that, I mean he marked out on big rolls of, of um, uh, brown paper every foot and every movement of each one of those last moments of Frank and the other uh, German sailor. Um, he studied both military archives and was convinced that only Frank could have fitted the description in all the eyewitness accounts. But as Captain Carpenter commented afterwards, the condition of the mole made it impossible to be absolutely certain. Um, and it could have been that in that first um, headstrong dash towards the German gun, um, he was hit. Uh, but it was very confusing battle at that point. What's sure is that Frank never got back to the vindictive. While these diversions were going on, the Navy managed to sink the three block ships close to the lock gates, and many Britons were killed in the raid. But entirely because of Frank Smoke, Brock's smoke screen, no ship was sunk as the task force withdrew. Ever since, controversy has raged about how much practical damage was done to the Germans' ability to use the river and subsequently for um, their submarines to get out in Bruges. But there you can see where the block ships were sunk. And you can see how jolly difficult it would be as a submarine to get them out. The raid on the river lasted for an hour and was so intense that it could be heard in four countries. Eight VCs were awarded before breakfast. Um, and it's more than any other single engagement other than the Battle of Orcs Drift uh, from which the film Zulu was made. The other thing is it's the last time ever a ballot was used for a VC. And what that meant was um, the, Admiral decided how, the Admiralty decided how many uh, VCs should be awarded. And then the Navy put up 
a number of people for it. And then those people who took part in the raid decided in a list uh, who should get the VC. Never again was that to happen, and I'm very pleased. The raid on Zipriga um, re-established faith in the Royal Navy, which had been badly dented after Jutland. For Winston Churchill, Shabrugger gave the Navy back its panache that it had lost in Jutland. He wrote subsequently that the raid may rank as the finest feat of arms in the Great War, and certainly is an episode unsurpassed in the history of the Royal Navy. Admiral Sir Walter Cowan remarked, Zabrugger has done more for the honour of the Navy than anything else in the war. At the time when the German spring offences had beaten us back and not the stuffing and the confidence out of the Allied side. Here was a hugely admired, audacious raid with immense courage, only possible because of Frank's inventive genius. It captured every newspaper in the world for days and boosted the morale greatly, just as it had the opposite effect on the Germans. Possibly out of all proportion of the actual strategic, tactical damage that was done, as Napoleon famously intimated, in war, morale is to the physical as three is to one. Perhaps concerned that Frank had been taken prisoner, he was mentioned anonymously in the Commons by the first sea lord. This is uh, Lord Fisher. A few days after the raid, Lord Fisher wrote to Liberal MP uh, George Lambert, agonizing over Frank's death in his letter, emphasizing each of these words, I feel actually the death of Rob. And after the war in his memoirs, Fisher wrote, my dear friend Rob, of imperishable memory, a victory across bravery, wickedly massacred at Tibrugge. Frank left behind uh, my grandmother and uh, my mother, aged two and a half, and an unborn daughter, my aunt Francesca, uh, who was clearly named after Frank. There they are. There's a, a moving perspective uh, on Frank's death uh, from uh, G to one of her friends. I'll let you read that. Major Thomason, one of the Army's official correspondents, described Frank's death as a loss of gravest description to both the Navy and the Empire. And perhaps interestingly, recognizing the significance of Frank's death, in 1937, the Nazis named the destroyer after his killer, Hermann Kuhn. So this brings my talk to an end. But I, I would just say, as a little boy, I recall every uh, St. George's Day, an old man with a stick arriving wherever we lived around the country, and we moved quite a bit, and my dad was a vicar, um, with a sixpence. And he would always give my mother for me a sixpence. And that lasted until 1972 when we were And I never saw him afterwards. And in his will, he gave me a walking stick. Um, made from the wood of the addictive um, with a, I'm sure to say, ivory top and bottom to the, to the walking stick. It was a, a beautiful walking cane, which I still have at home now. But there were a lot of people that followed um, Frank Brock, and um, I hope I've given you a flavor of the story, and um, I can't do it justice that my brother can, uh, but it's all in the book, and it's also, mentioned, as I say, in this fantastic book. So I'm really happy now to take any questions. And if I can't answer them, um, I won't bluff it, but I'll find the answer for you and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, what an extraordinary story. Um, for me, perhaps the most extraordinary thing about it all is, is that we know so little about him. He's just not known. If you think of the sort of significant inventors of World War II, like Frank Whittle and Watson Watts, Barnes Wallace, their household names, or they are for many of us, and yet Frank Brock seems to, despite having a famous family name, seems to have disappeared into the midst of history until 
thankfully brought back by Harry uh, and Mark. So, um, but please feel free to ask any questions. And uh, Mark, I'll ask you to repeat the question for our people on Zoom. Sure. Thank you. Okay, show the front. When the factory, when the factory blew up and the street blew up, where the loss of life, because he was carbon and built the factory, he must have had a tremendous challenge there to, with the families and that sort of thing. But there was, and he felt very responsible for it. And that's why it took 40 years to rebuild the whole piece. So, yes. Thank you. In the middle row. What gas was put into the Zeppelins? So, oh, now that's a good one. I, I think it's true. Sure. Yeah, what gas was put into the Zeppelins? I think it's hydrogen, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I'd have to check. Right. Okay, back corner. Uh, what was it? What he found that it, is he buried in a war grave? There were three Royal Navy uh, officers found uh, dead on the the mole, and they're buried in the um, war, the Commonwealth War Graves um, uh, burial site in Zeebrugge next to the German um, uh, rating officers that were killed. And whilst they don't say who each of them were, they say these are three British Army officers of which one was Frank Roll. Okay. Um, I was wondering whether the uh, balance went to Depress uh, the lower down at uh, their elevation uh, on the top of the mole, so they could only shoot the top of the uh, vindictive. That's, that's a very good question, and, and I don't know, obviously, because we haven't got those guns to, to test. But I would have thought they would have had that ability to depress um, a significant way because the last one was somebody sneaking up on you, and certainly, I, I'm a tank soldier. Certainly one of the things that we always did was to make sure that you could depress right up. So in case any infantry were coming, sneaking up on you. And if necessary, you would go to a slope rather like the slope of this and put your tank here to maximum depression to make sure you could do that. So um, they, when I'd been on the mole, those guns weren't there, so I don't know. Yeah. So, but it's a good question to find out from a, a, a military historian who might know. Thank you. Um, we've got a question on the Zoom chat. It says, a uh, question on the Zoom, could the fact that we don't know much about Frank Brock be because he doesn't fit neatly into a box? He's not, a, he's not just an inventor. He was also a, you know, a, a sort of a daring do brave military leader. Is that part, might that be part of the reason we know less about him? I, it could well be, but I suspect it was also because a lot of his inventions were kept secret. Um, during the, the rest of the First World War and then taken forward into the Second World War. Um, and I think um, there was a view that we didn't, they, they didn't want to make too much about him. But really, two of the one, not to give away some of those secrets of invention, but also secondly, that if he had been taken prisoner, the Germans probably didn't know how important he was and they didn't want to give them a um, propaganda victory. Okay, any more? Mark, oh, just as we look around the age of the people in this room and uh, what our grandchildren ask us, what do you wish you could ask him if he was alive, if you'd met him, what would you ask him? And then if he ignored your question, what might he tell you about life now that we should learn from him? Brilliant question, Marshall. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, possibly um, I, I'd like to know what he would have changed as an experiment in his classroom so it didn't blow up. Because <laughs> um, I'd be caned with bloody awful. Exactly. So um, probably that that would be that would be the first question. And um, what would he how would he look at things like the Ukraine war now? I'm, I'm actually going to not answer your question, but I'm going to answer a different mm -hmm. question, which is this story and the way that the Ukrainians are fighting the war shows how important morale is and how small um, bands of determined men can achieve extraordinary feats uh, uh, of warfare. And if you think about the way that the Ukrainians have used their um, 
commercial grains. They haven't got military grains. Well, they might now. Initially, they had commercial grains that they bought from shops and on Amazon, where they used the light switch as the electric switch to release a grenade uh, from the grain. So they were able to go uh, drop grenades over over um, groupings, order groups of military senior officers and drop them right in the center uh, without them being noticed. Uh, I mean, just brilliant use of technology. So I haven't answered your question and I, and, uh, I think you'd be uh, amazed at the service that's going on at the moment. We've got time for a last question, sir. Yeah, thank you. Interested in the missiles from rocket control they did with the aircraft? Were they actually deployed in the First World War at all? You know, that a question. Yes, they were no rockets. Those immediate rockets used. They were, um, but the um, I think they were only used once or twice uh, because uh, there was a fire hazard because they were they were um, pyrotechnic, and in those days there was an awful lot of uh, volatile fuel and oils on those paper airplanes because of uh, fire. So they weren't piloted in light very much. Excellent. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, now, before you leave this, I'm sure there's time to quickly refresh your glasses if you, if you want, very quickly. And there are, obviously, as uh, Mark said, there are books available, uh, some signed by Harry. Yes, so uh, first edition, signed by Harry. Point to my friends. So to conclude, another round of applause for Mark for a trip.